Hello and welcome to Datacast Solutions Introduction to NIME for the Data Analyst. In this chapter, we're going to cover the reading of files and an overview of how to do that. Probably the most single common task you're going to want to do is to read a file. And generally that file is going to be on your local drive. The question you need to ask before we decide how to read a file is, is the person who runs this workflow going to have a copy of that file you're using? And are they going to have it in the same location on the hard drive as you have? If you're the only person running this workflow, that's not a problem. But if you intend to distribute it to others through, say, the NIME hub or the production server that you might purchase, um, then you're going to need to account for the actual location somewhere. So we're going to look at a few different ways of managing this. It's all going to begin with the file reader node. And within that file reader node, you're going to have to identify to NIME where that file is. NIME offers us five distinct methods for how to identify a file's location. So I'm going to walk you through not just the file reader node, but the different ways you can specify the file's location. When I'm working on a workflow that is only going to be used by me, I take the simplest, easiest path, which is I'm going to identify the actual local URL to where the file is actually located. So let's take a look at how to do that within NIME. I'm going to start here in the node repository and I'm going to search for the node file reader. And as I begin to type it in, it fills it in. And I'm going to go ahead and now I'm going to drag the file reader up onto my workflow. And now I can right click or double click on it but I'll right click also and I configure it and tell it where this file is I'm going to actually be looking for. Now I'm going to browse to the location that I happen to have it in and mine is going to be on the D drive and I've got some data files in here and I've got some reference data and I'm going to read this country master file. And now you'll notice Within the file reader, it's brought up a few things. First, it understood that there were column headers, um, and it, it checked that out by default. If the first row did not contain column headers, I can uncheck it. It's made its best guess as to what the column delimiter was. In this case, it was a comma, since it's a comma delimited file. Um, if you change these things and say it's actually a, a semicolon is the divider between them, you'll notice it now thinks there's only one column. Um, so it, it generally does a pretty good job of figuring out what it needs to do. I can also go into the advanced tab to set up some of the more common things that I might have to do with this file reader as well. Um, I might come in here for example and in the character decoding process I might tell it this is a UTF-8. If it has characters for example in Chinese or any other language character set. Um, also, a very common one I do is short lines. If for some reason you have embedded carriage returns within your double quoted strings, the lines will end early. And um, I do this simply to handle this, um, to handle the idea that, that a line may not actually finish and there won't be as many data fields as I think there should be. Um, there is a different file reader node that allows for carriage returns. We'll talk about that one a little later. And then finally, you'll notice in each one of these, it's done a check in the column heading from the row and the data type. So for example, it's decided that this column, the country master record ID, is an integer. I can double click on any of these column types. If I double click on the header, I can change this and say either don't include this column and say I, I don't want this in the input table even though it's in the file I don't want it in my table. So I can check that off or I can change it to say even though this is an integer I might turn it into a string. A common reason I might do something like that is if a field is all numeric numbers but it has leading zeros. Let's say for example the NPI number of a physician. Well, that's a 10-digit number, but some people have a leading zero. If I read it in as an integer, it would now drop that leading zero and I'd be left with an invalid NPI number. So I tell it to read it as a string, and those are actually now going to be retained. 
and I can specify what represents a missing value, a null value. So depending on who generated the file, I might say they might have put the keyword null or a question mark or some other mechanism. Maybe they put um, you know, the word null like that and that was supposed to represent a null value. You can specify what the string value that might be present that represents a missing value. And now that I've got my file configured, you can see this is a local path file. It's literally just told it it's in the D drive. I told it exactly where the file is. And I can click OK. And then I'm going to right click and I'm going to go ahead and execute that node. The status is green. So let's go ahead and look at the contents of what's in that file. I can right click over it. And the last option on the menu is always looking at the output of the port. This is the data that I've read in. I've got 252 rows. I've got 86 columns that are in here. And if I scroll right and left, I can see all the data that's available to me and what has been read in. And I can scroll up and down in this case. When you got millions of rows, that's not a great idea if you don't have a lot of memory, but in a small file like this, it's very acceptable. You can click on the tab with file specifications and you can actually see each of the data types and um, which were strings. You can see the upper and lower bounds for numeric values. You can see if they're string values and they have a common set like a uh, member of the EU8. It's either yes, no, or unknown are the three known values. So you can see the different value pairs that are available and so on. Um, and I'm going to click back on the actual data and I can do some also things here that make this really good. I can right click over something like, um, uh, oh, I'm going to scroll off to the right here. And I can look at this column called developing or developed. And I'll right click over it and say, show the possible values for this column. There are three. There are developing, developed, and unknown. So that's something I can do also for pretty much any column on the independent show me the possible values. They're part of the CN, they're in dispute, uh, so I can see all the different values that are available. It's also possible for me to turn around and just single click instead of right click, and I can sort. So I'll sort this in ascending sequence. And now I can actually scroll down and look at all the different, um, the different values here that are saying, are they independent or part of the UK and so on. So these are just different ways that you can actually view the data. Um, gives you a chance to look at it before you go on to your next node. Now yet an even faster way to actually um, put a file onto your workflow is to drag and drop the file that you want to read directly onto your workflow. In which case, NIME will provide a direct link to that path that you've dropped in. So let's take a look at how NIME does that. All right, I made the NIME window slightly smaller here so I can do a demonstration of physically, it's very easy. I find the file that I want to actually read and I'm gonna take my country master file just like I did last time. And this time I'm just gonna drag it. In this case, it's an Excel file and or it's referenced, but it's actually a CSV. And I'm gonna drop it on here. And you notice this time it's just slightly different in terms of identifying that it's a file and it's provided the proper location and everything else is the same. Um, I just didn't have to go browsing for it um, before I brought the file onto the workflow. So it's just another quick method of putting a file up on the screen. So now what happens if you need to distribute a copy of this file with the workflow? So you aren't going to be the person running it. You notice all the NIME examples, for example, that NIME provides. Well, they have workflows and they have data that are attached to them, sample files. If you're going to deploy your work to somebody else's machine or onto the server, you're going to need to actually distribute a copy of your file with the workflow. So the first thing we're going to need is we're going to actually look at creating a copy of this file somewhere else within your workflows directory. And let's take a look at an example of how to do that. So you'll notice right now, I've got still my working example of Scott Sample 1. And if you see here on the left side in the NIME Explorer, 
That's part of the Custom Class 1 uh, workflow group, which is part of the Training workflow group, which is part of the NIME workspace. So I'm going to create a directory underneath Custom Class 1 where I can store my data files that this workflow is going to be executing. So I'm going to minimize this and come back to my directory here. And let's take a look now at my NIME workspace right here. And under the training folder, we said we created this one called Custom Class 1. And there is got sample right here. So I'm going to, with underneath this folder, I'm going to go ahead and just create a folder. And the purpose of this folder is to store actual data. Doesn't matter what you call it, you can literally give it any name you want. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. I'm just going to call it data um, because this is where I want to store the data for my workflow. Um, I could put it at any layer. I could put it under the custom class or under the training. I'm putting it right under Scott 1 because that's where the folder is going to be. And now I'm going to go back into my sample data. And I'm going to take this reference country master file and I'm going to drag it and copy it over into the data directory. Just like that. So now I've got another copy and it's now actually part of the workflow that I've just created. And now that that's ready, let's go ahead back into NIME and see how we're going to make use of that file. All right, so now let's go back into NIME and let's make use of that, um, that file that we've just created. So I'm going to go ahead and drag out a file reader node again, and I'm going to configure the file reader. And this time for a location, I'm going to give it a location of the NIME workflow, uh, which represents instead of saying file or the D drive, I've actually entered it with NIME. And I've said nime.workflow, and then I told it it's in the data directory, and then I gave it the file name. And you'll notice down, it, of course, found the file because that's where it was located, and everything else is the same about the node. So this is, allows me to put all of this together and package it together as one individual workflow. So I can now execute this and read it. Now the way I might make use of this later on if I were to turn around and save my work, and then if I were to right click over here and I was going to export this workflow because I want to send it to somebody else, I would export that workflow and say, um, you know, this is, it's going to put it out to a, a KNWF, which is essentially a, um, it's essentially a, a zip file um, that's very specific to NIME format. And that zip file, once I execute it, if somebody else gets it, they're going to get the data directory because it basically created a zip of this entire directory. And so the file is actually there with this workflow. Somebody else importing it is going to get the file directory as well. NIME actually gives you uh, a few different ways of doing this. Um, the workflow relative URL location you saw, I gave you that example where it's nime.workflow slash and then you provide a directory that it's going to be located in. You can also do what they refer to as an absolute URL. So you can specify it as the local workspace and then tell it, just tell it it's in the example workflows under the data directory and basics adult. So you can put it that way or you can specify it uh, relative to the nine mount point, which is going to be more useful when it comes to a server to say, I don't know if this is running on the server um, versus a local workspace, then that's fine. It'll work locally for me. And then when I move it up to the server, it will work as well. Now I'd like to show you two more examples of two additional readers that I use very regularly. One is a CSV reader. The thing about the CSV reader is it doesn't work nearly as fast as the file reader, but it's a little less temperamental and understanding of formatting mistakes within the CSV file itself. 
I will at times see the file reader fail and I can replace it with a CSV reader which works just fine. So I'm going to grab the CSV reader up front and I'm going to put it here and I'll paste my same mount point here. Now again I can tell it does this have row headers and column headers, does it support, support short lines. Don't have nearly as many options as you saw within the file reader. Um, other than frankly the option of changing the decoding to like UTF-8, I really don't have any other options that I can change about this. Um, but I can go ahead and execute it that way. And so the CSV reader is a, a very common way I'll get around formatting problems with the original file. The last note I wanted to cover from a reader perspective is the XLS. Um, very common that I get files in Microsoft Excel format. So I'm going to go ahead and drag the Microsoft Excel reader out here. And it is, like everything else, going to be slightly different. So I'm going to configure this. And I'm going to browse for a file here that I still have also in my NIME directory. I have some standard data files and I've got some reference data and I've got um, boy I've got some this is an actual Excel spreadsheet. See I can see it's it's an XLS file. So I'm going to go ahead and double click this and open it and you can see one of the things it picked up so it there's no column headers here um, so I my file simply has a list in this case of a name and some common aliases for that name. So Aaron has Ron, Ronnie, Aaron, Ronnie. These are all different aliases um, for a person's name. So what you'll notice within here, I can choose the tab within the spreadsheet that the data is on. I can specify whether it has column headers. I can skip portions of the spreadsheet if I don't want to read them all. Um, so there's a great deal of options, again, here within the Excel reader that I can work with as well. But now as I click OK and go ahead and execute it and look at my output table. All right. So there are, of course, many other readers available through NIME. It can read and write Google Sheets. It can read table, a special version of which basically allows you to pass workflows between nine um, information between nine workflows using with their own internal table reader. Uh, it supports parquet tables, graph databases which are network readers, um, JSON and XML readers, image readers, shape files, wave files, um, and then all types of specialty, chemical informatics readers and DNA strand readers and all kinds of other things. So um, if there is a source of data out there you want to be able to read, it's very likely it's already been incorporated into NINE. This concludes this chapter of the class. Feel free to move on to the next chapter.